setting was just when the first people moved out to Montana and their life was in the prairie and farming and ranching. Kind of rough and tumble, a lot of stuff, a lot of new stuff you're not really used to coming from like I guess Boston or wherever you came from. Well part of my family came over and started a homestead over near Georgetown. You are given a couple hundred acres of land and you're supposed to make a living off of this. The government tried to get people out in the West and they enticed them. You could shoot your food, make lumber, and, or you could go trading. I'm inclined to think of Little House on the Prairie and like vast swarms of locusts coming over the land out in eastern Montana. Well, that and copper probably were like just giving people land to live here and farm it and stuff is probably what brought a lot of people. Um, I'm not sure why else people would come besides farming and stuff like that. So. Noted Montana historian Michael P. Malone considered the state's homestead boom the most far-reaching revolutionary development in the state's entire history. Changes in federal land laws, railroad promotion, unusually wet years, and new farming techniques and equipment spawned the boom. Immigrants swept into Montana by the tens of thousands to populate its forests, high plains, and prairies. They changed the state's economic, political, and social fabric. They directly affected Montana Indian tribes by taking up non-allotment lands on reservations. The homestead bust proved just as dramatic as the boom. Farms were abandoned, markets disappeared, and towns died. The bust left a depleted landscape that still displays homestead-era scars. Only the most resilient of settlers adapted to the new conditions and survived. They became the core of Montana's 20th century agricultural community. A few years ago, rumors were brought to North Dakota of the wonderful state Montana. Father, who was always longing for something better, became very excited. He was told that in Montana, alfalfa grew 10 to 15 feet high, that land yielded 50 to 60 bushels of wheat per acre, and that potatoes were so large that two spuds made a bushel. Montana or bust, that's my motto, said Father. I have a homestead right, and why not use it on Montana's fertile plains and shining mountains? There we can make all kinds of money. Well, Father, who liked to make money very easily, could hardly sleep at night for two weeks, thinking what he would do with all the money he would make. When we arrived at Fort Benton, Father took us to our home, 14 miles from town. Here we expected to sit under tall, green trees and to shoot a deer or an antelope as it ran down to the cool creek below the house to get a drink from the never giving out water. But instead, the only shade we have from the burning sun comes from the four by eight shacks and the cedar fence posts. And the water! That would almost make Father dizzy. We have to get our water from a precious stream that flows about four miles away. Only fellow dryland farmers can appreciate how we felt during those days. Our disillusion and disappointment is now a closed chapter. Although we may lack many city conveniences and miss the shady nooks and babbling brooks of the east, where can we find such glorious sunshine and such invigorating breezes and such beautiful views of snow-capped mountains? In the springtime, the fields are of the most beautiful green and we are always sure of a bumper crop. In the fall, the fields of golden waving wheat makes us wish for nothing better.
Many Indian societies, perhaps all of them, have been very closely attached to the land, largely because their daily food, their livelihood, their shelter, things that are needed in life, come more or less directly from the land. A number of the tribes that are here have been here as long as we're aware. Between the Civil War and 1885, the population of the U.S. nearly doubled. Needing additional land, stockmen, farmers, miners, and rail promoters all hungrily eyed American Indian reservation land. They had already started advertising land on our reservation, and that makes me think about Pete Beaverhead, a tribal elder who said they hadn't even seen our land yet and they'd already sold it. That was um, in 1887. The 1887 Dawes Act not only cut up the reservation lands into small pieces, providing a so-called land surplus that could be sold off, but also cut up tribal affiliations and traditional practices with the goal of turning American Indians into independent farmers. When that law, and that didn't cover all reservations and say every reservation is going to be, we're going to allot individual pieces of land, it had to be applied individually to each reservation. The Flathead Allotment Act was not from a good intention. It was influenced by real estate speculators, uh, businessmen in Missoula, uh, Senator Dixon. My great uncle could talk about uh, riding his horse all over one day, then homesteading came and all of a sudden he got on his horse and the barbed wire fences were everywhere. We lost over 60% of our land base uh, through allotment and homesteading. In a very short span of time, we became the minority landowners and the minority population in our own community. And we remained the minority population in our own community because of uh, allotment and homesteading. Be it enacted that any person who is the head of a family or who has arrived at the age of 21 years shall be entitled to file on 160 acres of unappropriated public lands at $1.25 per acre. Esther Strasburger is born March 5, 1888 on her parents' Iowa farm. Esther leaves the security of home at age 19 Accompanied by her older sisters, Lydia and Anna, Esther travels west for a teaching career in Washington and free land in Montana. Almost 100 years later, Esther's legacy remains in the shadow, cast by her great-granddaughter. Montana is like uh, looking out the window. You know, everything is always happening outside. It's pretty quiet. Rebecca Lee lives just 25 miles from Esther's original homestead. I think about if she ever in her wildest dreams imagined that, that there would be someone like me who still is outside, but is outside for a recreation, you know. Montana's rural lifestyle provides educational opportunities for Rebecca. Rebecca Lee. Just as it did for Esther four generations earlier. With so many public elementary schools springing up in new communities across the West, teachers, like the Strasburger sisters, are in high demand. Salaries that would attract men would be too costly for rural communities. School districts save money by hiring women and paying them less. In her day, I think they had, they didn't have many choices. They probably either had to be a nurse or a teacher or get married and have a family. Esther joins a class of 500 students, three quarters of whom are women. A teaching certificate means Esther, Lydia, and Anna can support themselves and work outside the home. 
Railroad pamphlets bragging about Montana's prosperous acres circulate across the country. Magazines encourage eastern city dwellers, immigrants, and even school teachers to move west for free land and endless opportunity. Why it said in this paper, why you can even raise bananas in the Sun River Valley. And we're laughing, we're going out, we're going to climb the trees and we're going to eat bananas. Traditional female homemakers would soon be the new home seekers the railroad tries to recruit. The opportunities of the Northwest are not all for men by any means. There is a terrible need for intelligent and skillful woman service. A single woman 21 years of age or over has the right to make a homestead entry. Marriage after filing does not invalidate her claim, provided she continues to reside on it and makes proper improvements. Brochures in hand, Esther and her married sisters board the train for Great Falls. My mother was raised in the Palouse country, and she got off the train and looked around, and, and there was no trees, everything was bare, and uh, uh, there was just nothing. <laughs> and she said, well, she says, I'll stay here two years, and that's all I will stay. And uh, she died here at 86. <laughs> A hired locator drives a wagon load of clients across the newly mapped prairie. I don't know why it was. The people seemed like people, maybe 35, 40 years old, were looking for a home. And whatever they brought with them, it was a bunch of kids. You never saw so dug on many kids. Every family had six, eight kids. Esther stakes her claim within walking distance to her new teaching job at the Hepler School. Lydia now with a baby boy, and Anna, file on bordering plots a few miles from Sims. What it used to be like? Nothing. Nothing. I tell you, it's one of the worst places you could ever go. You can't raise hell on 40 acres in Montana. No. Yeah, there's been a lot of changes here. You know, people moving in and building houses. Like this used to be a store. Here was a bank. There was a big mercantile store, and I ran to that little brown house. This little house is the one that Esther had. Esther's homestead shack stood a little larger than the average 12 by 14 feet. A bed and other sparse furnishings decorate the interior. She uses a large tub for washing dishes. Perhaps later she could afford a cook stove and maybe a table and chair. For the first time in her life, Esther lives in the privacy of her own home. We had water in the house, but there wasn't running water. You had to pump it by hand. We had the well, had horses, cows, pigs, chickens. She didn't milk the cows, but she always helped with the separating the milk here. And my mother wore high lace shoes, uh, and I, I remember they had, they were always speckled with milk, you know, slopping over from the, the milk cans. And then we had the thin sugar beets, and that was the awfulest job anyone ever, ever did. <laughs> We'd crawl until our knees got so sore, and no one that's, that's never done that doesn't know what work is. <laughs> More and more students fill Aunt Esther's schoolyard. The original Hepler School closes, and pupils relocate to the larger reclamation building. Her sisters begin working on Main Street. The post office, inside C.J. Kinna's general store, hires Esther and Lydia. March 1914 marks the beginning of a 22-year reign of the Strasburger Postmasters. Lydia can support her children, and Esther's new wage is higher than her teaching salary. These paychecks, along with leasing and working their 160-acre plots, bring success. The year Esther, Lydia, and Anna filed, four out of every ten homesteads failed. Despite several hardships, the sisters prove up on their claims. Out of 7,700 government land patents for Cascade County, one-sixth are issued to women. The homestead boom moves Montana's economy towards agriculture and the population towards family groups. 
Jeanette Rankin, and other Montana suffragists take advantage of these changes. Rural citizens accustomed to seeing women work in and out of the home are receptive to their cause. And so the homesteaders finally tip the suffrage scale in favor of Montana women. Six years before all American women win the vote. I, I can't think of anywhere else where I'd want to like stay forever. I would have liked to know, you know, why or what went through her mind when she first stepped off the train, whether it was bleak, like it can be fairly bleak here, <laughs> um, whether she was excited or kind of like, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> I think that, that she must have had a lot of, um, well, you know, you can say nerves and guts and stuff like that, but she must have just really known who she was. <laughs>